Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to the second of the Humanitas Lecture Series on World Order, its pr past, present, and prospects. My name is Brendan Sims. I'm the professor for the history of European international relations um, here at the Department of Politics and International Studies. It's my great honor and a pleasure uh, to reintroduce the speaker, uh, Professor uh, Richard Haas, who is the Humanitas Visiting Professor in Statecraft and Diplomacy this week. Those of you who were here uh, yesterday, of course, will have heard uh, John Dunn's uh, introductory remarks, uh, which I will endeavor not to duplicate as much as possible. Dr. Haas has been for some two decades a central figure in the United States foreign policy establishment. He holds the rank of ambassador. Uh, he has advised uh, on both the Middle East and Northern Ireland, uh, where he replaced uh, Senator uh, George Mitchell at a critical stage uh, in the negotiations. He is currently, uh, as you all know, president of the US Council on Foreign Relations. Now, this remarkable bipartisan institution serves as the institutional memory um, and as an advisory body um, on US foreign policy. And it's for this reason uh, that Dr. Haas has known uh, several US presidents and their administrations uh, very well. Unlike its counterpart in most other countries, uh, the US Council on Foreign Relations is based not in the capital, Washington, uh, but uh, in the commercial hub, the commercial center, uh, of New York. Uh, some people say that that reflects where true power uh, really lies. Uh, I wouldn't say that uh, for a moment, um, but I hope it's true uh, because it would mean uh, it would be good to know uh, that it lies in such capable hands as those of Richard Haas. It would be hard to find a scholar um, more suited to write on the subject of world order. Dr. Haas has written widely on US foreign policy and global politics. Early works on nuclear deterrence uh, were followed by studies on sanctions and post-Cold War uh, US foreign policy, especially uh, the vexed question of intervention. His most recent book is Foreign Policy Begins at Home, The Case for Putting America's House in Order, which shows, to borrow one of his own phrases, that the business of foreign policy uh, is not necessarily um, foreign policy alone. Now, order, the subject of this week, we heard yesterday, does not just happen. There is no invisible hand directing world order. That order needs to be established and nourished. In a magisterial sweep through the centuries, Richard Haas has already taken us, yesterday, from the Westphalian settlement to the eve of the present day. He has spoken of the balance of power, of anarchy, international society, humanitarian intervention, and much else. Where will he take us next? You are about to find out. Dr. Haas, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Sims. What you've just heard is the academic equivalent of the overture being better than the opera. <laughs> So I shall uh, do my best to live up to that introduction. It's good to see so many of you here. Uh, I was worried after yesterday I would discourage uh, folks from, from showing up. As those of you who were here will recall that yesterday's talk introduced and discussed the notion of order and disorder and traced its evolution over roughly four centuries. And the, the principal focus was the, the breakdown in the run-up to World War I and World War II, but fundamentally different, uh, in no way resembling one another, uh, what were brought it about. The first I described as more accident and carelessness. In the second case, it was very much purposeful. And in the first, in some ways, Order broke down even though a rough balance of power existed. And in the second case, order broke down in part because the balance of power no longer existed, partly because of German and Japanese efforts and partly because of the lack of them on the part of this country, France, and the United States. 
We then discussed why, in many ways, the Cold War stayed cold. It was a very different order. Uh, for the first time in history, one buttressed by not just the presence of nuclear weapons, but nuclear weapons deployed in number and in a fashion that made it uh, uh, purposeless, if you will, to strike first. And that was the whole genius of the way nuclear weapons were, were deployed, that there was no incentive to go first because the retaliatory capability of the other would be sufficient to make sure that the side that went first did not in the end come out better. There would only be two sets of, uh, of losers on a scale history has fortunately never seen. The Cold War, as you all know, ended roughly a quarter of a century ago. And in many ways, order has deteriorated since then. And that's the uh, subject of today, which is where we find ourselves a quarter century after the wall came down a quarter century after a former boss of mine, President George Herbert Walker Bush, proclaimed the arrival of a new world order in the aftermath what looked to be an unprecedented coming together of the world, working through the Security Council, to reaffirm one of the basic norms and rules of international order, in some ways what made an international system an international society, to harken back to Headley Bull, which is the idea that territory cannot be acquired through the use of force. And when Saddam Hussein, 25 years ago this summer, attempted to do just that, an unprecedented international coalition came, came together to rebuff him. And it was on the, in that context that people were talking about a new world order. But again, 25 years later, one does not encounter optimism when one talks about the subject of, of international relations. And when I discussed order yesterday, uh, talked about it in terms of existing powers exi uh, supporting the, the arrangements of the day and mechanisms for challenging them, for changing them, pardon me. And also that there was a certain minimal understanding historically uh, about what order covered. And essentially it was respect for the so-called quote unquote sovereign rights of others, that what happened within their territory was largely off the table of international relations. And since then, though, the entire debate about order over these many centuries has, has evolved to the point where there are many ideas out there of what you might call, as we discussed, an expanded notion of order, which is far more ambitious in its uh, undertaking. If it were, in fact, implemented, it would be far more consequential. But the very ambition has raised barriers to its actually being accepted, much less implemented. And the, the three debates or axes, I suppose you could call it, about order was first of all, who participates? Historically, traditionally under the Westphalian classical model, it tended to just be the major states, then also particularly in Europe. Now it's not just global, but it's many others, state, medium-sized states, major states, minor states, but also non-state actors that, uh, if one likes the chess metaphor, you've now got a lot more than your traditional number of pieces on the, on the board. And the whole question is, what is their relationship to the formulation and execution uh, of order? The second area in which the notion of order is potentially expanded is how do you deal with a set of challenges, which are in some ways the hallmark or defining challenges of this year, yet are not challenges traditionally between major states. And by that, I mean essentially the challenges that have been thrown up by globalization. Uh, again, globalization being what is vast, fast flows of things, people, what have you, across borders. How do you manage them? And how do you structure them or regulate them so the beneficial dimensions of globalization are embraced? And so they are just, they're strengthened and potentially more can participate and benefit from them. And how do you push back against and discourage the negative aspects of globalization, those flows which are, which are harmful. And order now has, if it's going to be meaningful, uh, many of us would argue has to take that into account. Increasingly globalization is not a choice that we make, it's a reality that we must contend with. And then thirdly, in addition to the, the question of who participates, in addition to how one takes into account global phenomena, 
is this third age-old question, which goes back in some ways to challenge the fundamental basis of the original Westphalian notion, which is whether order is adequate if it only deals with the foreign policy of states. But there is a powerful point of view for many reasons, some related to what I just discussed, uh, questions of globalization, but some simply related to principle, to what uh, the academics here might call normative issues, that order needs to take into account what goes on within society simply because it should. Not because it's consequential for the foreign policies of these societies, though it may be, but simply because it should, that we have an interest as, as individual human beings or as um, citizens of a society to care about what happens to our fellow human beings, simply because. Not for consequential <coughs> reasons because it affects us directly, but simply for reasons of principle and basic morality. So all three of these areas, the participation question, the, the global question, and what you might call the internal question are now on the table. So order has become, if anything, an even more complicated and even more challenging concept of international relations, but it's no less important and it's no less fundamental. I still believe it is, in many ways, the framing issue for understanding what is going on in the world. Now, here we are 25 years after the end of the Cold War, and we still call this era the post-Cold War era. That tells you something. See, in this business, there's all sorts of uh, prizes, either bestowed or self-bestowed, uh, on the part of academics to, to name the era. And there's a, there's a kind of nonstop competition for who can coin it. But whenever you call something post, it means you don't have a name for the era. You only know what's in your rear view mirror. You don't know where you are, much less where you are heading. And that tells us something, that 25 years after the end of the Cold War, things are fundamentally uh, unsettled. And uh, the relationship between forces of order and disorder, or anarchy and society, to use Hedley Bull's uh, metaphor, is very much uh, up for grabs. Nothing has sorted out, nothing has uh, settled out. And until they do, this era, I think, will remain unnamed. It will continue to be called, in many ways, the post-Cold War era until the new era defines itself. And then it will give us a context in which to, to judge where, where, where we are. Still, despite the lack of uh, nomenclature, it doesn't mean that it's totally anonymous. There, there are some, I would argue, emerging characteristics of this new, or in some ways not so new, era this era that's a quarter of a century uh, old now. In no particular order, it's an era of American primacy. And let me just be careful with the word, primacy. Uh, the United States is first among unequals in the sense of capacity and power. Uh, in terms of legal status and the rest, claims on morality, I, uh, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm simply talking about objective measures of capacity, U.S. economy, is, is the world's largest, U.S. military capabilities are the, the world's uh, greatest. But to say this is, first of all, not to boast. This is simply a, a statement. And second of all, no one should ever confuse primacy with hegemony. Simply because the United States has the most capacity doesn't mean it's in a, tr it's in a position to get others to do its bidding. Uh, indeed, one of the fundamental concepts of the field is the difference between power and influence. And the United States may have more power uh, in its hands than any other single actor or agent on the world scene, but it can't always translate that power into effective influence, which is the ability to get others to do what you'd like them to do. Uh, it doesn't happen that way nor for all of its power, for the fact that it's, there's a period, this is a moment of American primacy, that's not to be equated or in any way confused with what some have termed unipolarity. A unipolar world is a, per, is a world in which power is so concentrated and consolidated that there's only one meaningful agent. This is not that world. I would argue it was, it was never that world, even uh, in the immediate aftermath of the end of the Cold War, but it's whatever it was then, it's less of it now. That 
whatever position the United States has, it is not one of our uni unipolarity, and I'll come back to what it is. And the reasons for that are in part changes in the world. Power has now spread. Others, for example, if you look co compared to 25 years ago, if you want to use that as your data point, one looks at, say, a country like China, which has until recently averaged growth in the area of 10% plus or minus. Well, you do that uh, for long enough and your, your economy grows dramatically. The last two decades, Japan has drifted, but before that, Japan was one of the world's most, most capable uh, economies. Other types of uh, economic shifts have taken place because of the, the price of, of raw materials, and exporters obviously enjoyed certain advantages. So partially, the U.S. position has changed relative to others simply because others have grown faster, in part also because the United States is a more mature or advanced economy. It's harder to keep growing at certain rates when you've reached certain levels. Uh, second of all, though, I would say that the U.S. position is not quite what it was uh, because the U.S. capacity to use its power is less than it was. Power is not simply an abstraction. It's not simply a measure of how much stuff you have. It's also a, re it's a it's, it's your ability and willingness to use it. So simply because we have things doesn't mean we're, we're willing and able to use it. That, that requires, for example, a degree of political consensus, a willingness to, to run risk, to accept costs. And societies evolve over time in their willingness and ability to make decisions and, and take, uh, take costs. So for all these reasons, I would argue that the United States still enjoys a position of primacy, but not the position it had. And as I said, one of the fundamental key characteristics of the world we're living in is diffusion essentially centrifugal forces, where more power is now more widely distributed in more hands of more kinds of entities than at any time before in recorded history. And this is, I think, a, a central to an understanding of what's going on in the world, that whether you're looking at military power or economic power or political power or cultural power or what have you, there's more players and more si si types, states, big, small, in between, but also in cultural areas, you've got corporations, you've got media uh, companies, those who make films in Bollywood and Hollywood who have tremendous uh, clout. In this country, an organization like the BBC, in our, my country, uh, various networks or film studios have tremendous cultural power. In the area of health, one of the most powerful actors now is not a nation state, it's the Gates Foundation, as well as various pharmaceutical uh, companies. Uh, so virtually every slice of human activity, recently when you had the Ebola uh, outbreak, a group like Médecins Sans Frontières, an NGO, in some ways was as consequential as any other entity on the planet in dealing with the, the outbreak of uh, that disease in, in, parts of, in parts of Africa. Economically, you can't talk about the world just in terms of the United States or China or the EU. You've got to look at companies like Google and, and Apple. You've got to look at the large energy uh, companies. You've got to look at sovereign wealth funds and, and so forth. So my point is simply that in every domain of international life, you've got more actors than ever before with, I believe, more distributed capacity than ever uh, before. So the world is uh, not unipolar by any means. It's also not multipolar. When people use the phrase multipolar, they're usually talking about give or take five, three, four, five, six, something like that. When we've talked, the phrase has been used in history, we're talking about five principal, th four, six, concentrations of power. This has gone way beyond that. And it's important to recognize this because it has real consequences for the subject of this talk, which is diplomacy and statecraft. Uh, at the risk of getting ahead of myself, think about it. If you've got power in that many hands, you can't get three or four actors in a room and just because they agree, you got a deal. The whole idea is if power has diffused far more broadly, suddenly the task of corralling all the players who can make a difference has become an order of magnitude more different. So you've got now not unipolarity, not uh, multipolarity. Some have said emerging bipolarity, but again, no. Even the United States and China together, if anything, will have, a, I believe, a declining share of, say, global GDP. And in many cases, even if the United States and China agree, 
It's not going to be enough to deal with the next disease outbreak. It won't be enough to deal with, with climate change. It won't be enough to stop the spread of nuclear weapons. It won't help you about what to do or solve for you what to do about, say, what's going on in, in Europe or the Middle East or Africa or anywhere else. So no, this is not going to be a bipolar world to the degree that we came out of a largely bipolar world during the Cold War. Again, power will be uh, much too diffuse. My, uh, my favorite phrase for this world of uh, m many states who can make a difference, uh, of non-state actors, benign and malign, from ISIS to the Gates Foundation, uh, from Al-Qaeda to, to the BBC. Uh, these are, uh, this is a world of you know, powerful non-state actors, malign, malign and, and benign. All these states, you've got regional organizations from the EU to the OAS to the AU in Africa. You've got international organizations, the IMF, the World Bank, the UN, uh, what have you. And then you've also got forces like globalization that again, their things move beyond the control of governments, in many cases beyond the knowledge of governments. So what I would call uh, this world is a world of non-polarity. It's a world of such diffusion. It's so many dots, it's almost like a Surat painting. You don't have to have a specific picture of anything, but instead you've got so many dots, it adds up to a world of a really a virtually unlimited number of poles that can make a difference in different geographic contexts and different issue, context, issue contexts. Different points count for more or less, but on virtually every issue, there's now an enormous number of actors who, uh, who, can, uh, who can make a difference. Uh, this has some real consequences, a world of such diffused power. One is that decision making has also gotten decentralized. As I suggested before, the idea that you could make a couple of phone calls or invite a couple of people to a meeting and think that essentially you've dealt with it, no longer. The whole image of what Henry Kissinger wrote about at the Congress of Vienna where a couple of great statesmen could get together in a room, a Talleyrand, a Casare, and a Metternich, and somehow decide pretty much the fate of the, of the European world for decades. For better and for worse, those days are, uh, are long gone. That ship has, has long since uh, sailed. And you're seeing examples of this every day. Look at the kind of thing you're seeing now in the Middle East, where Saudi Arabia and the UAE are making decisions about how to deal with the situation in Yemen. This is not a world where necessarily the United States or China or anybody else, the major powers, are calling all the shots. And not only are there others making decisions, they're doing, they're actually shooting in some cases themselves. They're taking actions. This is a world of decentralized capacity and decentralized uh, decision making. It's a world that has weakened alliances also. Uh, and some, you know, for different kinds of reasons. But I would say in part, alliances require a degree of predictability. Who's the threat? Where is the threat likely to manifest itself? What are my obligations? Well, in many cases, those sorts of characteristics are missing from this world. Again, a world of diffused power, great dynamism, technological innovation, and all like. It's very hard to predict. Indeed, we've, we've entered a situation. It's one of the reasons, and I think we hinted at it yesterday, why diplomacy has become so much more difficult that you can find yourself cooperating with the country on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays on this issue and opposing them on Tuesdays, Thursdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays on another issue. Very, very hard to say in some cases who is a predictable ally for all seasons and who is a predictable adversary for all seasons. And alliances tend to do best in those situations where you have a high degree of structure and predictability. Well, many of those things have gone out the window in the, uh, in the world uh, we live in. So what we have is a world of unprecedented dynamism, unprecedented spread of, of, of capacity, harder to build and sustain formal uh, structures. Uh, indeed, when I was preparing these remarks, I was thinking about it, it's increasingly hard to speak about international order. And by, let me be, let me be clear on what I mean. I'm not saying there isn't order in the world, but it's hard to speak about order as a single global phenomenon. Because what we're seeing is you can have order here and not there. Or you can have a degree of order dealing with this functional challenge, but not on this one. So we may have more order or less order, say, dealing with uh, the regulatory features of banking 
In the aftermath of 2008, we've actually introduced a degree of order through the Basel III arrangement on, say, capital requirements. So there, there's actually been an increase of order in the world in that functional issue. You probably couldn't say the same on dealing with some issues dealing with either the environment or the spread of nuclear weapons. Or things look fairly orderly, at least on the surface, in large parts of Latin America, uh, in most of Europe, obviously not near uh, Ukraine, in lots of, of Asia, but things are anything but that in most of the Middle East. So it's very hard now to speak about international order or disorder when one at the same time, we essentially have both. Uh, so increasingly, uh, I've come almost around to the idea is that we're, we need to think now about international orders and regional orders in the plural, because it's, it's, it's getting tougher to, uh, to generalize. It's ironic, and I never thought I'd end up here, simply because we're living in a global world. And you would have thought that globalization would be an overlay which would mean pretty much the same thing for every part of the world and everyone in the world, but no. It's become a highly differentiated uh, world where it's, you can speak about international order, but it's almost a process of math rather than strategy. You can add up all the stuff and you can say, given how I weight things, there's this amount of order or disorder in the world, but in some ways it's arbitrary. Because no matter where you come out as a global average, it may, be, it may not be sufficiently positive for some regions or issues, and it may not be sufficiently negative for, uh, for others. So it's very much a, uh, a mixed bag, shall we uh, say. What I wanted to do is spend a few minutes going through what I'm talking about first at the global level and then at the various regional levels. And I'll use up the bulk of my time uh, doing that. At the global level, let me give you an image, which is uh, we've got this host of global challenges from proliferation of nuclear weapons to climate to trade to other economic issues to disease to cyber. So you've got this, this grab bag of global challenge. These are all manifestations one way or another of, our, of globalization. And in every instance, I would argue there's a gap between the challenge posed by these issues and the rules that uh, are accepted and put into place through standing arrangements to deal with them. Deal with them. That there's this uh, global gap. In some cases, it's an intellectual causality there. We don't have the answers. More, no, more often than not, it's simply various countries and others don't agree. There's an absence of consensus, and the absence of consensus on what the challenge is or what to do about it, not a lot happens. And that's essentially where we are in virtually all these issues. Take nuclear proliferation. Right now, we have the five original nuclear uh, powers, the United States, Russia, China, Britain, and France. We've got four others, India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea. Uh, several of these now lie outside the non-proliferation uh, treaty. And we have the question of Iran. And Iran has become uh, not just topical, but critical, because as goes Iran, will also affect possibly three, four, five other countries in Iran's neighborhood. If Iran is allowed to progress far down the path of gaining nuclear weapons, uh, I would think it's a very high likelihood that several other countries would not uh, simply accept that without trying to match it in one way uh, of their uh, own. Which suggests to me the fact that North Korea has what it has, maybe 10 nuclear weapons along with two programs to produce material for several times that number, both an enrichment program and a reprocessing program. Pakistan is now the fastest growing nuclear arsenal in the world. Uh, that you have all this going on. It suggests to me that the, non the, 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 the norm or the rule against the spread of nuclear weapons is much more in principle than in practice. Uh, and on top of that, there's no consensus for what to do in this, in, this, in this eventuality. This is now happening. That proliferation, to some extent, has happened with Pakistan or India, Israel, or North Korea. Could happen with Iran and several of its neighbors. And the question is, what do you do? Do you live with it? Do you sanction people for doing it? Doesn't seem to have stopped North Korea or Pakistan or India uh, or Iran, or do you use military force against it? If you are to use military force, who would say it's okay to use military force? Or would, you, would some, could some just use military force? So we are there. Here's a perfect example. 
where we have this principle against the non -prolifer against the proliferation of nuclear weapons. It seems to be, it's meant to be one of the bedrocks of post World War II international relations, but the gap between the challenge and the arrangements in place is large and potentially getting uh, larger. Or take climate. Uh, this year, later this year, November, December, everyone's going to show up in Paris to have the next big meeting to deal with the climate challenge. Uh, I would say there is approximately zero chance, uh, not to hedge my bets, <laughs> zero chance that there will be an agreement that the countries that will be represented in, uh, in Paris will agree on what would be a common price for carbon. I think there's approximately zero chance that they would agree on a global, what's called a cap and trade market, that permits would be issued for how much carbon you could be emitted and you could be a buying and selling of uh, permits between and among those uh, there. I would think the most they could agree on is that governments would essentially make pledges, that they will do their best to meet certain goals or targets in terms of energy intensity, essentially fuel efficiency and its relationship to GDP growth, or in terms of carbon output by certain dates, along the lines of the U.S., Chinese, and U.S. Indian agreements of, of recent uh, months. What this suggests to me is that the varying economic positions of the countries is, is still so great, and where they see themselves on their own scale of development, or a country like India. I remember the conversation I had years ago with the Indian uh, Minister of Electricity, and he said, uh, Dr. Haas, that's all well and good what you say, but we still have 500 million people who don't have electricity. And the idea that we're going to keep them without electricity in the name of somehow you know, keeping India's uh, you know, behavior in the realm of climate change, what you and the West want to see, there's zero chance that's going to happen. So all I'm saying is I think that the uh, likelihood that we're going to get a deal in Paris this year or anytime soon that's going to significantly affect uh, the future of climate is extremely, uh, extremely modest. Another area, trade. The WTO, the World Trade Organization, the principal body for dealing with trade, uh, is stalled over issues like its coverage of agriculture, uh, the coverage of services, increasingly services are becoming more important than manufactured goods for many, uh, over subsidies and how you regulate uh, subsidies. What we're having instead is a proliferation of bilateral free trade agreements, FTAs, and regional trade agreements, such as the ones, say, the United States, and what is it, 10 or 11, I forget the number, countries in the Pacific are negotiating, uh, or the, the transatlantic free, free trade agreement that's being negotiated. Uh, and you know, it's not simply that the, the regional and, free, and bilateral agreements, uh, you, you can't take them for granted, but again, they're not as meaningful because you can't deal with certain issues at a bilateral and regional level. So one of the reasons that world trade, while it's growing, is not growing nearly as fast as it could or should, is simply the lack of a agreed upon order in this uh, area. Take another economic area. A lot of countries in, uh, at various times want to uh, stimulate their economic growth. One of the ways you do it is by lowering interest rates and you make it very cheap to borrow. One of the problems is that when you lower interest rates, one of the other uh, effects is on currencies and basically countries that do what's known as quantitative in easing through lowering of inter interest rates or putting out instruments which increase the money supply in their countries, it, it makes the value of their currency relatively weaker to others. What that does is it means their exports go down in price and that imports to them go up in price. Uh, not everybody can do that at the same time. And so the question is, when is it legitimate for a country to introduce quantitative easing in various forms to stimulate its domestic economic growth, even if it has the effect of, improving, of increasing the, the attractiveness of their exports because it lowers their price. And at what point is that illegitimate? Because that's simply a form of currency war leading to trade wars. And this, trust me, is not an abstract question. It's about to become the biggest question on whether the United States Congress approves the new trade agreement, uh, with, uh, which, which involves countries which produce 40% of the world's economic output. Uh, so you're going to hear a lot about currency manipulation in the next few weeks. So the, the issue is, to what extent are we letting countries do things, again, domestically, 
even though it has consequences beyond their, their borders. This is another area where this entire question of order is not academic by any means. I guess I can't use the word academic in a pejorative way here. Uh, <laughs> betraying my bias here. Uh, it's not theoretical, uh, but rather it's, uh, it's, it's, it's painfully, painfully real. I already talked about uh, disease. Uh, again, it's the question. You have an outbreak of a certain virus or something. Or, and uh, to what are the obligations of a country to deal with it, to report it, and to deal with it? to not allow people to travel beyond its borders if they can, to screen for it. Because again, it's not simply a domestic health matter. Very quickly, it becomes a, a glo global health matter. And what do we do if they're unable or unwilling to meet those obligations that we think every country ought to see fit? Or cyber. Uh, you have these new technologies, the internet and all that, phones, you know, things like this, what have you. Uh, good, but at the moment, you've got this burgeoning technology with virtually no rules. The analogy I've been thinking about a lot is the, is the comparison to nuclear weapons. And by that I mean in the 40s and 50s you had this emergence of a new set of technologies called nuclear weapons. And what grew up uh, was ultimately a whole set of rules to try to make sure that the, the, emergency, the emergence of this new set of technologies did not tip the balance in the world towards disorder. And what I talked about before in the context of the Cold War, uh, mutual assured destruction, deterrence theory and all that, that developed by bringing together scientists, military men, foreign policy types, mathematicians. They came up with a new vocabulary and a new logic. Because it's not, think about it, it's not self-evident that uh, nuclear weapons could actually add to order. But in fact, they did because of how they were regulated. And the idea was that we would try to create, amongst the five who had it, mutual assured destruction. And we would try to prevent it going beyond uh, the five. Well, now we have this new technology that not simply in two hands, like the US and the Soviet Union, or five hands, or even nine hands, but in millions of hands. And we've got all sorts of state and non-state actors. In many cases, we don't know who they are. They're hacking this or that. And by the way, who, uh, what's the rule about hacking? And by the way, what's the rule about espionage? And by the way, what's the rule about stealing intellectual uh, property? What's the rule about using cyber to attack? What are the rules? And who decides? Well, at the moment, what we have is this explosion of a new technology with all sorts of commercial and diplomatic and potentially military consequences. And there's no rules. There's not even a vocabulary. So North Korea goes after Sony because it doesn't like uh, a movie. I think most people who saw the movie didn't like the movie either, but that's another, <laughs> that's another matter. Uh, but we didn't attack Sony for it. You know, uh, may have simply asked for our money back. That's a different issue. Uh, North Korea had a different take on it all and attacks them. Well, Sony doesn't have cyber retaliatory capabilities. What's the role? of the state. How, how, how should we in the United States, or we as an international, as a world, respond to North Korea? What, is, what kinds of behaviors do we want to encourage and discourage? Do you sanction North Korea? Must you respond to cyber behavior with, with cyber behavior? Or what about responding not in kind? At what point could a cyber attack justify a military response? What are the rules? Putting this out there, I'm simply saying that again, you've got this new technology and the gap between the rules for the new technology and its impact is enormous. Actually, the gap is even growing. And I would just sort of say in an academic setting like this, this is a place where outsiders can and need to make a real difference. Things are happening so fast. And you need people who, have, who understand technology, understand international relations, understand the law, understand commerce. You need people to come together who can begin to work this out. Because uh, right now, this is, to me, the area where there is probably the greatest uh, difference or gap between where we are and where we need to be. And again, what worries me is that that, that gap could well be uh, growing with tremendous uh, consequences. So you've got all these areas of globalization where there isn't any consensus, or even close to it in many cases of order, or even when there is a degree of agreement, we can't get people to act on it. Again, it's not enough just to have intellectual agreement. You've got to have action. And we continue to have the age-old question, in any way, in some ways more intense than ever, 
about what is quote unquote domestic. And at what point does what go, go, what going on inside one's borders become the business of, uh, of others? And I would simply say that because of all these, these differences about how to deal with global problems, how to deal with this basic question of what happens to people inside borders, that the phrase international community, which you hear all the time, you're not going to hear it from me. I do not believe there is an international community. To me, international community is aspirational. And that ought to be, in some ways, one of the goals of statecraft to, to bring about an international community which believes certain uh, concepts which are central to order and is willing to support action on their behalf. But right now, we do not have an international uh, community. At the major power level in the world right now, you've got, as always, elements of order and disorder. We still have elements of nuclear deterrence in place, major powers. When I say major, I'm really talking about the United States, China, Russia, Europe, Japan, India, arguably one could add a few others, major, medium-sized powers. Uh, they're very cautious about direct military confrontation with one another. Uh, there's a lot of economic interdependence between and among them, trade, investment, uh, what have you. Uh, in some cases, they even agree on how to deal with this or that global problem or, or part of it. There's no, major, there's no major conflicts going on between one major power and, uh, and another. I think the real question going forward is what is the balance between competition and cooperation between and among them going forward? And here there are some real worrying signs. Uh, there's differences on a lot of issues. We could, happy to talk about virtually every issue I've mentioned. There are differences, say, between where the United States stands and where a Russia or a China, in some cases a Japan and India or Europe uh, stand. Nationalism is growing, uh, particularly in places like Russia, but also in Asia. If you look at China, Japan, and other countries, you see nationalism, if anything, uh, stronger in, in Europe. It's, it's more of a mixed, uh, mixed situation. Very different views, as I said before, of what you might call sovereignty and the obligations uh, of states and what happens, what's the world right or obligation when states, quote unquote, misbehave within their borders, uh, and so forth. So there's, there's, there's strong view elements of disorder coming from also relations between and among the major actors. I already talked about global gaps, and after 2008, we saw things like contagion because of uh, questionable economic policies, to say the least, in my country, uh, how it then got a hold of, uh, you know, got on the conveyor belt of globalization and, and, and affected uh, others. These are all forms of, of disorder. The institutions in place around the world are, are mostly uh, not able to contend successfully uh, with them. Places like the UN Security Council, which is kind of the iconic institution, uh, I would simply say this. I would wager that not one person in this room, if given a blank piece of paper and a pencil, would draw up a UN Security Council that looks like this one if they were given the chance today. The UN Security Council of 2015 represents what people in the, mid, in the early 1940s thought the configuration of power in the world was going to be. Now it's 70 plus years later, the fact that everything from uh, India, to a Japan, to now a United Germany are not in the Council and so forth. It just makes no sense that the Security Council simply doesn't reflect uh, the current uh, realities, but you can't change it simply because any conceivable alteration to the Security Council would, would have perceived winners and losers. And shockingly enough, it's good you're all sitting down. Those who would see themselves as losing from the changes tend to oppose them. So you, you simply can't, uh, you can't get it. Or even something like the International Monetary Fund, where increasingly the voting shares don't represent the, the wealth of various countries. Uh, of course, of opposition from members of the US Congress, the United States will not support changes in the voting mechanisms of the uh, IMF. So again, the, the institutions are having trouble keeping up with the world, another source of disorder. Uh, we've tried to, the world has tried to catch up. And if you remember creating things decades ago, like the G7, and then the G8, more recently the G20, uh, 
But there's always still problems of inclusion and exclusion. There's real problems of capacity in these groups, what real authorities they have. And there is what I call the multilateralism's dilemma. And essentially is, there's pressure to include more and more actors in any undertaking to give it representation and legitimacy. But you know and I know, the more you include, you detract from efficiency. And that is the dilemma of modern day multilateralism. And, there's no, and the word dilemma is overused. It, it belongs here. You, you, can't, you can't escape it. Uh, I'll talk quickly for a few more minutes. I'll just introduce it about some of the regions also. I want to leave at least a half hour for your, uh, your, your, your comments and, and questions. Uh, Europe, uh, as a region, at least until recently, you would have said it looked as much like Francis Fukuyama's end of history world as anywhere else seem to be uh, relatively integrated, relatively prosperous, relatively at peace. Well, now it's none of the three. Uh, it's, you know, there's questions about its peace, there's questions about its prosperity, and there's, pres there's questions about the future of how uh, integrated it is. So I think that's simply a reality. Uh, I expect Professor Sims will disagree with me on some of that, but, uh, but there you have it. Uh, I also think that one of the consequences of this, which is bad beyond Europe, is that Europe's willingness and ability to be a, a great, uh, a major power outside of Europe is going to decline. Has real consequences for the United States. Uh, our, if you will, the Atlantic Partnership will be less of a feature of American foreign policy going forward simply because Europe increasingly doesn't have the decision-making ability, the capacity or the mindset to be a, uh, a, a global actor. I think the most immediate threat though for Europe is obviously uh, the Russian threat. Uh, Mr. Putin seems to be uh, increasingly rejecting the notion that territory can't be acquired through the use of military force. He seems to essentially be arguing that there's a kind of Putin or Russian doctrine that wherever there are es ethnic Russians that he believes are in somehow uh, in, in jeopardy, that he has the right to use military force to quote unquote protect them. That is needless to say a uh, a recipe for massive disorder. We've seen it in Crimea, we've seen it in Eastern Ukraine. We can't see it still uh, elsewhere. Uh, the big part of the world which is most worrisome, and we could give an entire set of lectures on just them, but I didn't because I can only hand, handle so much depression, is the Middle East. Uh, it is simply to say the least successful region of the world has been, is, I fear will be for some time. Uh, the parallel I have uh, come to use over the last year or two is the parallel to the 30 years war in Europe, uh, where for just that, for, for three decades, you had political religious struggles across and within borders. I know like all historical parallels, there are exceptions, but I think what, what is the same outweighs what what isn't, and you know, in the Middle East already we have uh, four failed states or civil wars, Syria, Iraq, Libya, and Yemen. These types of situations tend to go on unless one of the locals wins, unless an outsider imposes order, unless there's compromise. Well, I don't see any of those three about to happen. I don't see any of the locals likely to win. I don't see any outsider willing and able to impose order. I do not detect much of a spirit of compromise in the Middle East. If anyone here does, I want to hear all about it. Uh, what that suggests is then this continues to go on until it burns out. And one of the worrisome things is that political religious struggles tend to burn out very slowly. It is a combustible uh, brew. And if anything, we're seeing it still spread. Uh, you know, I have two rules of the Middle East, which I will share with you. Uh, one is that things get worse uh, before they get even worse. Uh, I do not assume that we have necessarily bottomed, uh, but indeed I, I tend to think we've not. My other rule for what it's worth is the enemy of your enemy can still be your enemy. And, and we are proving that with some uh, regularity. Uh, in the Middle East, we can discuss why that is the case, the mixture of what things local and what things outsiders have done and what things outsiders have not done that have made this so. And I really do think there's a combination of local realities and both acts of commission and omission by, by, outside, uh, by outsiders. But I do think that 
none of the prerequisites for stability uh, are there. And as I said, it, it could get worse given the refugee burden on states such as Jordan, uh, given what we discussed a minute ago, the nuclear dimension, depending upon how things work with, uh, with Iran and so forth. So I don't see any signs that order in the Middle East is, is uh, about to uh, about to emerge. The Asia Pacific has been the most successful part of the world. You've actually had almost a historical combination of extraordinary economic dynamism and growth and political military order. And it's going on now for three or four decades. And often in history, you can't have that. That growth leads to military spending, leads to change in power relationships. And that changes ambitions. And coming back to the ideas of yesterday, it creates uh, actors who either feel the current arrangements or who tend to feel the current arrangements are no longer satisfactory. And because this growth being unequal has changed the balance of power, it, it leads some to have opportunity or to perceive they have opportunity. But so far, at least, things have stayed pretty stable. Despite you got China, Japan, both Koreas, Australia, Vietnam. Uh, you got, unlike the Middle East, you've got strong states with strong national identities. On the other hand, nationalism's powerful. You've had nothing in Asia, anything akin to the kind of rapprochement you've had between Britain and France here after the Second World War. There's nothing like it, say, between Japan and, and China. And I just use the parallel of the 30 years war in the Middle East. The parallel that comes to mind when I look at Asia is pre-World War I Europe. So while it appears to be orderly, and it has been orderly, I don't take it for granted uh, by, by any means, simply because You've got all this growth, you've got all this dynamism, you've got literally dozens of territorial uh, disagreements that have never been resolved. Basic relationships of history continue to poison the present. You haven't had rapprochement. You've got an absence of confidence building measures, an absence of diplomatic mechanisms, very few shock absorbers. It, it's worrisome to me. I don't take the peace and stability of the Asia Pacific uh, uh, for granted, and that's why the parallels to pre-World War I worry me, because a lot of people say, don't worry, there's too much economic interdependence, it wouldn't make sense to go to war, and I go, you're right, it didn't make sense then either. I just don't take it uh, for granted. So one of the real challenges, and I would say, for diplomacy and statecraft is to do something uh, about that. I haven't even mentioned the problem of North Korea, happy to discuss it more. Uh, South Asia, which is really a separate subregion. Uh, history of you know, war from the birth of uh, India and Pakistan periodically uh, since. I already talked about Pakistan's nuclear arsenal. Uh, I want to say two things. If in, the, in Asia, East Asia Pacific, the challenge is one of strong states, very much in command of all their resources and what goes on within their territories. What worries me about India and Pakistan in the case of Pakistan is a weak state. Weak governance, weak, weak political institutions, very powerful military and intelligence organizations. It's not quite clear who you not, when you knock on the door in Pakistan who answers. It's not quite clear who actually exercises real authority. And unlike the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, it's not clear to me that nuclear weapons in South Asia are necessarily bolstering order. What worries me, and I've been involved with this various times in my career, is that there could be real temptation amidst the crisis to use nuclear weapons first. Or to put it another way, at the worst moments of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, there was greater interaction and greater thought about how to stabilize the relationship than there is between India and Pakistan now. And that ought to uh, give you a uh, pause. Uh, I know I've left out Latin America and Africa. It's not because they're unimportant. But the clock is ticking. And I uh, am happy to talk about either. I would simply to say that Latin America has turned out considerably better in the political military order sense than anybody would have imagined 20, 30 years ago. Uh, there's a lot of democratic market oriented countries, or at least countries that are moving to some extent in that direction. There's no big interstate conflicts, no nuclear weapons uh, problem. I'm not saying there aren't problems, and very quickly you could have the implosion of Venezuela, but I'm saying that all things being equal, not bad. Africa, very much a mixed 
situation. Very hard to generalize about a continent with more than 50 states. You've got a lot of st probably dozen to 20 or so states that are showing real signs of economic and political improvement, better governance, better economic uh, reports. You've got a large number of states that, that aren't. You've got some real governance problems in some states. You've got uh, minority issues. You've got terrorism issues. Worrisome, uh, you know, some worrisome developments in Nigeria, despite the recent uh, peaceful rotation of, of power. Uh, you've got some regional organizations and the AU, the African Union, that have some capacity. But again, uh, an uneven future, which means an uneven present and likely to be an uh, uneven future. For the United States, uh, let me see, I'll stop with this, and then we can be more prescriptive in the uh, Q&A about what to do about all these things. I would simply say that uh, I began the talk by saying that the United States, uh, you know, this is a moment of American primacy. I think that is uh, true. And I would simply say that order, be it at the regional or global level, deteriorates without an active, uh, effective uh, United States. And I know this may not be a welcome sentence from an American and all that, but I simply don't see any other actor or set of actors <laughs> willing and able to fill those shoes. I'm not saying we always get it right. I just don't see an understudy. I don't see anybody else in there in the wings who's both willing and able to play the role of a global leader on behalf of global uh, order. And one of the things that concerns me about this is the United States now is more, con is more divided than is the case, has normally been the case uh, politically. The degree of polarization in Washington uh, is, is, is worrisome. It means that we can't get lots of things done. Uh, Brendan mentioned my last book was called Foreign Policy Begins at Home. It doesn't end there, but it begins there. And what worries me is a lot of the domestic challenges which fuel American power, we're not doing what we need to do to meet those challenges whether the quality of our K through 12 education, our infrastructure, dealing with our long-term uh, debt, uh, modernizing our immigration system, and so forth. So what worries me is that even though we're growing at a level that many Europeans would envy, we're not growing at nearly the level we, we need to, or the level we, we, we easily could. We're also suffering from a bit of intervention fatigue after Iraq and Afghanistan, and we're fragmented. There is no American foreign policy consensus. It's not that there's Democrats versus Republicans, but within each party, there are fundamental differences. Some of these are differences about how much foreign policy to have, the old debate about guns versus butter. Some of these differences are about something we've talked about a lot here, which is whether the principal purpose of American foreign policy should be what's called realism to influence the foreign policies of others, <laughs> or whether the principal purpose of American foreign policy should be to shape the nature of others, what goes on inside their, their borders. And again, there's Republicans and Democrats and independents who think each one of those things. And then there's a third debate, in addition to the how much foreign policy and towards what end foreign policy, the third debate is how much we do unilaterally as opposed, multi, as opposed to multilaterally. And we see various people and parties at various points along that uh, spectrum. So at every point, uh, now we have a debate about American uh, foreign policy. So that's where we are. We've got, um, as always, order and disorder in the world. Or to put it more realistically, we've got orders and disorders in the world. But if I were to add them up, sorry to say, I come out slightly more negative. I am uh, worried about where we are and I'm worried about the arrows. I am worried about the trends. The Middle East is obviously the biggest problem. But I'm also, as you heard, worried about South Asia, very worried about, uh, uh, your, you know, about what Mr. Putin may be up to here, and also underneath the surface of a, what appears to be stability in East Asia Pacific, what could possibly happen there. And as I said, I think the gap between global challenges and global responses is, is pretty large. What's so interesting about this period is you've got differences between and among the major powers, but these aren't then the principal drivers of history. They're not the drivers of the disorder in the Middle East, and at the moment they're not the, dis the drivers of what's happening at the, uh, the global uh, level. So I want to leave it there today, basically having painted the scene, and what I wanted to do tomorrow was talk about uh, what do we do about all this. So tomorrow is the day for uh, answers. Today is the uh, day for fleshing out exactly the uh, challenges, either at the macro, global level, 
or take it region at a time. Thanks very much.